So chapter 21, mm -hmm. public records, titles, and closing. So in this chapter, you're gonna be able to explain the New Jersey Recording Act that explained the chain of title, evidence of title, and marketable title, all things that we have studied and that we have brought up before, but we're gonna go over it again anyhow. And we're gonna talk about the processes involved in the closing. And the Recording Act is, uh, says that any party with an interest in the real property can record those interests and attach, by attaching those documents to the public record. For instance, if somebody owes uh, you money, you could uh, attach that into the public record, uh, attaching it to the real estate that they own. Uh, you could file, basically, you're recording a lien against the property, right? Uh, just like a bank would do. If, um, if you had outstanding debts, if you were a contractor that had not been paid, you could take that and you could file a lien in the public records. If you have a long-term lease for a property, you could record that long-term interest in that property because the Recording Act allows you to do so. It allows the public to file in the public records, attaching to the ownership documents in that real estate to anybody who bothers to do the research and look it up, that has an interest in that property, it gives legal, public, constructive notice to the world of our interests in that property. And these are all terms that we're gonna be learning, okay? The county clerk is generally the recorder of deeds, um, but there's a separate registrar of deeds in Camden, Essex, Hudson, Passaic, and Union counties, because these are more the densely populated counties in New Jersey. Uh, so they have a separate registrar uh, specifically for the deeds and for adding the documents, recording documents to the public records. Okay, so on page 348, turn to page 348. Mm -hmm. Okay, necessity for recording. So what establishes uh, the order in which people get paid back in the event of foreclosure that there's uh, a lot of people who are owed money and they have recorded in the public record their liens, what establishes the order in which people are paid back? Like the priority? The priority. And what establishes the priority of the liens? the date that they were recorded in the public record, with the exception of two things, taxes, because taxes always jump to the front of the list, right? And mechanics liens, they're retroactive back to the date that the materials were delivered or the work began, whichever was first. So recording a document is a written notice in the county where the land is located and the documents have to be acknowledged before they can be recorded. <clears throat> so, notice, caveat emptor. It's not pronounced caveat emptor, but you could call it that if it helps you remember it some way, I don't know. It means let the buyer beware. Caveat emptor, it means let the buyer beware in Latin. You know, all these terms that we're learning uh, or some of these terms we're learning are Latin. The Latin is used for legal stuff a lot and contract law and such. So caveat emptor, what does it mean? Let the buyer beware. That means it's your responsibility to do your own research. If you want to find out if there's an issue with the property, you got to do the inspection. You want to find out if there's any problems with the home, what do you do? Inspection. You get a home inspection. You want to find out if there's any problems with the title, meaning ownership, what do you do? Title search. Title search. You do a search of the public records, and that's called a title search. If you want to find out where your property's boundaries are, and if the neighbor got their fence up on your property or not, mm -hmm. how do you find that out? Um, do a survey, right? Isn't that another type of inspection? Yes. If you want to find out if you're in a flood zone, how do you find that out? Survey. You have your surveyor do an elevation study to find out what the, what's another word for elevation? 
a measurement of elevation? Oh. Begins with a D. Datum. The datum, 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 however you pronounce it. Uh, it's a measurement of elevation. So that's another form of doing your own due diligence, right? It's your responsibility. So let the buyer beware. So um, constructive notice means the information is available in the public record. Courts consider any information in the public record is already known by interested parties. Because if you bother to look, it's there for you already. It was placed there for you. Actual notice is any information a person has direct knowledge about. So if, the, if somebody put the information in the public record, you have constructive notice. Whether you look at it or not, courts consider that you've been notified. Now, when you actually search the public record and now you have direct knowledge of that information that you just learned, it's said that you have actual notice. Okay. okay. So recording sales or long-term lease contracts two or more years uh, is possible. All right. Let's go to caveat emptor. Let's highlight caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware on page 348 under the section of notice. And the paragraph below it, we're gonna highlight constructive notice or what the buyer could find out. Then go to the next page and highlight actual notice of any information which they have direct knowledge. Now let's back it up because I want you to also write something above constructive notice on page 348. I want you to write because it's recorded in the public record. So construct you have highlighted constructive notice or what the buyer could find out. And then you're writing above that because it is recorded in the public record. Okay. Awesome. Chain of title. Hmm. You know what I'm gonna gotta do. Gonna go. Gonna gotta do. Hmm. I have an interesting language, don't I? Something I I'm gonna gotta do. I'm gonna gotta open the whiteboard. We'll start there. So. As I open that whiteboard in the background here, Microsoft process for a second, then I'll close it, try to reopen it, and it should open right away, the way it works. La -da -dee 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 -dee. or maybe longer. So anyway, while that opens in the background, hmm. Chain of title shows the record of ownership of the property over a period of time. If you could search the public records and link one owner to the next, that creates what we call a chain. So chain of title, title means ownership. You're linking one owner to the next. If you could do that, there's many links in a chain, right? So now that we have a chain of title, you should be able to link one owner to the next by searching the public records, right? right. But do you have to record your deed in the public records? No. For it to be valid? No, you do not. All right, so sometimes if an owner never recorded their interest in the public record, it may be difficult to create that chain. And we call that a gap, when a gap is discovered or a break in the chain of title um, where we can't link one owner to the next, that could cause problems for future owners. 
uh, in getting financing, for example, or selling the property. The next buyer may not want to purchase the property if you cannot show that you have some sort of a link from one owner to the next. All right, so that uh, we need to clear up those uh, gaps or breaks in the chain of title. And this is often done with either a quit claim deed or a suit to quiet title. Basically quiet title, quiet ownership, quiet anybody's rumblings. We want a judge to decide who the owner is and not make any, uh, uh, you know, to quiet uh, anybody who may be making any grumblings that they're the actual owner. All right, so we want a judge to make a decision by viewing the evidence and then making that decision. So these are the ways that we sometimes uh, bridge that gap uh, in the in the chain of title or when there's a broke uh, broken link or missing link in the chain of title. We get a quick somebody to sign a quick claim deed uh, certifying that they uh, to give up any interest that they have, the last recorded owner anyway, um, and a suit quiet title. All right, so let's see if that uh, thing opened up. Yes, it did. Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm on the whiteboard here. I'm just looking for looking for this stuff. Chain the title. Chapter twenty one. There we go. Chain the title. All right. So when you search the public records, if you could see that Tom owned the property and he sold it to Joe and Joe sold the property to Bill, you put a circle around each person's name and you could link one owner to the next. Well, you got a chain going now, right? There's many links in a chain. See that? It's a chain. It's a short chain, but it's a chain. But then you see the next, the last person listed as the owner in the public records is Susie. But Susie did not buy the property to Bill. She is not linked to Bill. We call this a gap or a break in the chain of title. And how is that solved? By a quick claim deed or a suit to quiet title would bridge that gap. You need to have it bridged with, with some sort of a documentation that we would add to the public record. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, an abstractor creates an abstract of title. What is an abstract? It's a condensed history of all the documents that could be found in the public record pertaining to ownership. That's what an abstract of title is. Think of it when you get your uh, car insurance for your car. Before the insurance company gives you car insurance, they want to check your driving record. They want an abstract of your driving record, correct? And what is that? It's a condensed history of all your, uh, your driving history, right? So similar to an abstract of your driving record, an abstract of title is basically a condensed history of all the documents that can be found in the public record for all the owners throughout history, any liens that they had, any satisfaction of liens that were paid off. For instance, this guy, Tom over here, at one point he had a lien that was, uh, he bought the property 1972, January 10th, 1972. They created a lien on that property uh, when he got the loan. He paid it off in, 19, in January 1st, 1992, okay? So then the, his lien holder, his uh, mortgage company, the lender, they, they added another document to the public record called a satisfaction of lien showing that it's been paid off. They never remove the lien. Anytime a document is added to the public record, it is there forever. This way, future owners can search back the history and all the documents related to each owner that were added to the public record. And then you could order the title search and this abstractor who works for the title company or, or what have you that's doing the search of the public records will, will create a list of all the documents and the dates that they were recorded in the public record. And then they turn that list over to an attorney 
and an attorney examines it to make sure that all liens have been paid off, there's no outstanding liens, if there's a transfer of ownership in the past that all the owners, rightful owners or people who had an interest in the property signed off on it. Um, and that is one of the forms of uh, ownership, right? Uh, proof of ownership, an abstract of title with attorney's opinion. So before we get to that, uh, let's do some highlighting under chain of title. On page 349, highlight chain of title shows the record of ownership of the property over a period of time. An abstract of title is a condensed history of all instruments affecting a particular parcel of land. So also underline, because it's not in bold there, abstract of title. So we actually got two definitions there in that two sentences. One is chain of title. It shows record of ownership of the property over a period of time, linking one owner to the next. And an abstract of title is a condensed history of all the instruments affecting a particular parcel of land. Okay. Then on the line below it, we're gonna underline chain of title again, and we're gonna highlight chain of title, the ownership of the property can be traced from its origin to the present owner. Then we'll stop our highlight there for now. And it says, if this cannot be done, it's said that there's a gap in the chain or a break in the chain. Highlight a quick claim deed is commonly used to bridge such gaps. Sometimes, however, it is necessary to establish ownership by a court action called a suit to quiet title. Y'all with me? Yep. Awesome. Now, under evidence of title, the last words in that first paragraph that are in bold, evidence of title, highlight them. Or you already got them highlighted. I bet you do, right? Yep. You yes. know why you do? Because we went over this already. Because much earlier in the book, we skipped all the way back here and we went over this. <laughs> so if if somebody joined the class late and they did not have it, highlight evidence of title. And then highlight there are four generally used forms of title evidence. And then write, put a slash there and write proof of ownership. That's another way of saying evidence of title, proof of ownership. And then you're gonna highlight the four proofs of ownership or the four evidences of title, the way they'll word it on exams. Abstract of title with an attorney's opinion. And that's what I just explained to you what this is. Then abs uh, an attorney sends hires an abstractor to go down, search the public records. They create this abstract of title and they turn it over this document. They turn it over to the attorney and the attorney now examines all the documents that were found according to the dates and make and checks everything off, make sure everything is right. And then they pass judgment whether you have good ownership or not. Now, if the abstractor screwed up and missed something in the public records, well, they have errors and emissions insurance that would protect them in the event of lawsuit later. And if the attorney screwed up, well, good luck with that. You'd have to seek satisfaction by suing the attorney. Title insurance policy, I think, is way more secure. A title insurance policy is where you have a title insurance company that you want to buy insurance from. Before they issue you an insurance policy to insure the title, the quality of the title, they have their own abstractors on staff and they do a thorough search of the public records dating back as far as they can search, but at least 60 years. Um, and they wanna make sure that you have good clear title. And if they can establish that, then they'll issue you title insurance. Okay, so they usually do a thorough job and that's what we usually do in New Jersey. We get a title insurance policy because if the abstractor screwed up there, well, they issued you an insurance policy, you're covered, who cares? They'll pay you back any money that you have uh, in the property and they'll pay off whatever's owed to the bank. There's two title insurance policies there, a lender's policy and a buyer's policy. 
and uh, your, your attorney will probably order both of them for you um, that you'll have to pay at closing. And no, you cannot shop for a better price on title insurance. Let me just throw that out there. Um, the price of title insurance is determined by the value of the property. And it's, uh, it's, it's um, standardized by the state. So state law determines how much uh, somebody will pay for title insurance. And let me open up, I do have a link, I believe. Let me see if I have that in a... It may be in that Word document, but I don't, yeah, I think I got it in a Word document. I did not add it to the slideshow I was just looking at. Um, but give me a second here. I'm gonna open up my web browser. I'm gonna open up my web browser and I'm gonna show you guys where you can, uh, where you can get a calculator and see, Oh wait, no, that's the uh, something else. That's uh, the realty transfer fee calculator. Never mind. Um, anyway, title insurance is established by the state, and it, it goes according to uh, the value of the property. So you can't shop for a better price on title insurance anywhere. So that's the advice and guidance that you should give uh, uh, the home buyers. Okay, uh, they can't search for a better price for title insurance because that fee is established by uh, by the government. Okay. It's based on the value of the property. So you're, you're highlighting in the book there um, four evidences of title, four proofs of ownership, abstract of title with attorney's opinion, certificate of title. This is often oral or implied. Basically, the, the attorney may have searched the public records themselves and said, ah, you got good ownership. It's nothing in writing. Would you want to accept that as proof of ownership? Would you? No. Just a, an attorney saying, oh, you got good ownership? No. I wouldn't. I want something in writing, right? Yes. Yes. Well, who would accept that as a form of ownership? A lender would. A lender would at least want the attorney to certify to them that they had searched the public records and that you got good ownership before they released the funds for you to purchase this property. But as a buyer, I would not accept that. Title insurance policy. This is the most common thing that we do in New Jersey. And we, there's two policy types. A lender's policy, like I said, would pay off the amount that's owed and a buyer's policy would pay back uh, any money that the buyer had into that property so far. If somebody should step forward and prove that they have good title to the property, that they're the actual owner, you would have to give up that property. What do I mean? What do I mean here? What am I talking about? How come you guys aren't answering, asking me questions? Well, let's just say Let's just say that uh, Susie owns, the, well, let's just say that Bill owns the property right now, right? Mm -hmm. And he's going to sell that property to somebody else. And that somebody else did a title search. And they said, wait a minute. Oh, oh wait, uh, now forget about that somebody else. Okay, Bill owns the property now. He bought the property from Joe. However, the public records show that Joe and somebody named Mary own the property together. Hmm. Bill must not have done a title search when he bought the property because he still bought the property and only Joe signed the deed. So at any point, this Mary person can step forward and claim ownership to this property because she never signed the deed to sell it to Bill. Right. If she could prove that Bill's not the rightful owner, that he's got that property unjustly, he would have to turn that property back over to Mary, wouldn't he? Yes. Yes. Now, let me ask you a question. What happened if uh, Mary never stepped forward, but now Bill sold that property to Susie? 
And now Susie bought the property. Right. And now Mary steps forward. It's Susie's responsibility. So does Susie have to turn the property back over to Mary? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Mary but what about all the money that Susie got that she put down, down payment to purchase it and mortgage payments she's been making all along? Hope she got title insurance. Well, she should have done a title search, right? Um, and if she got title insurance, well, that would reimburse her all the money she's got in it. But if she didn't, she didn't get insurance. And she's screwed. Did she do? Did she do get some sort of a title search? Who did it? Did she get? Did she do the? Did she do the? Abstract the title with attorney's opinion. If that's the case, did the abstractor catch it or not? If not, we could sue his insurance. Otherwise, we got to sue the attorney for screwing up in their opinion of the abstract. Mm -hmm. If the attorney made a certificate of title, meaning that's verbal or implied saying, oh, I searched the public record, you're good. And they missed it. You weren't good. You'd have to sue the attorney to get your money back. Good luck with that. This is why we do title insurance most often. They do the title search. They try to do a thorough job of it because then they issue you an insurance policy. So if somebody ever does step forward and make that claim, you're insured, and so is your lender. You usually get both these policies. So Susie's going to have to relinquish the property back to Mary. She don't get to keep it. Now, some people may be saying that's messed up. How come Susie's not the owner? Well, because she bought stolen property. Right. Think of it that way. Even though it's not, it may not necessarily be stolen, you know, but think of it like stolen property. If I sold you a DVD player, right? Um, hmm. I don't know if anybody's got DVDs anymore. Okay. If I sold you, uh, I don't know, um, a, car. a TiVo or a fire stick or something, right? But I stole it from the store. And the, the cops catch up with you and they see that you got stolen property. And you're like, wait, I could prove I bought it from Victor. And you bought it from me, but I stole it. Do you legally own it? No. So are you going to get, you think they're going to let you keep it? No. No. Even though you paid for it, you didn't pay the owner for it. You paid for stolen property. So it kind of works on the same basis here. All right. Just to try to give you some kind of uh, rationale that you guys can betterly, better understand and grasp. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's why we have that title insurance policy is probably the best bet to go. Right. Because we do have instances where maybe documents aren't recorded in the public record or somebody didn't not every all the owners signed it and you know, there, there's issues that come up sometimes with title work that needs to be cleared up. And when it does, when we do come across problems, it's a pain in the ass. You know, I had this one girl uh, that I know, uh, she's a friend. She was looking to sell uh, her property and she, uh, she didn't go to sell it through me. Uh, but anyway, uh, she listed the property for sale. She found a buyer. Um, and, and she found a buyer for the property. Um, and they did a title search. And when they did the title search, they found out that the mortgage from the person she bought the property from was still showing on the property that it had not been paid off yet. So not only her outstanding mortgage was still on the property, but the previous owner's outstanding mortgage was showing on the property. But she knows that it was paid off because her mortgage paid it off but their lender did not file the satisfaction of lien. So it shows still as an outstanding lien because there's no satisfaction of lien to match it up showing that it's been satisfied and paid off. Could you buy that property still? I repeat, could you buy that property still? Yes. Would you buy that property still? Probably not. Probably not. I would say most definitely not. Right? Um, because why would you want to buy a property? It's got a lien on it. That's like the value of the house. Right? 
you want to make sure that, that gets uh, satisfied first. So she tried selling that property and um, she could not show, prove that it's been satisfied. So how can you prove that it's been paid off? Well, when you bought the property, when you bought the property, didn't you do a title search? Yes, she did. But she can't find her paperwork. She knows she bought title insurance too. Well, oh, good for her, right? She knows that at closing that the, that the attorney took out the money for the title insurance. Mm -hmm. but she paid for the title insurance, the title search and title insurance. So, but she can't find a policy. So what did I, I tell her to do? Because of course she's coming to me for advice now. So what did I tell her to do? What do you think? Contact your attorney. They're the ones that bought the policy, right? They should have the paperwork still in their files and their paperwork, right? Yeah. yeah. So she contacted her attorney. Uh, and she explained the situation. And the attorney said, uh, you know, she's like, well, you know, you got the paperwork, you bought the insurance. And he's like, well, that's your problem. This was her attorney. Rude. And she's like, well, just let me know who the insurance company is so that I can reach out to them. You bought the title insurance, didn't you? But as it turns out, she paid him for title insurance, but he never bought it. Yeah. He just said they did it. Is that legal? No. Uh, no, that's theft. So theft. where would you go from there? Well, I told her to, to hire an attorney and sue your attorney. Well, okay, it happens all the time. Attorneys sue each other, right? Shouldn't be a problem, right? She couldn't get an attorney that was willing to sue her attorney. You know why? No proof. Because he's now a New Jersey Superior Court judge. No, no. And any attorney was like, oh, I ain't suing him. Uh, someday we may have a case that we need to go in front of him. We're not going to be trying to get on his bad side by suing him. They're all scared. Uh, I was like, listen, go to the state attorney general. Who's that? It's the law, highest law enforcement officer in the state, right? And if you can't get satisfaction from them because of political reasons, go to the federal attorney general or, or file a complaint with the FBI. That's theft right there, right? Anyway, she never ended up doing any of that, but she tried to file a complaint with, uh, there's another way that you could get at attorneys to get them to take action, right? Um, get involved. How, how, how do you get an attorney to do something for you? Um, like tell them you'll win like a percentage if you win. You do what, sorry? Like if there's money involved, like they'll win a percentage of whatever. Well, you're not offering them money because you already paid them money. Why would you be paying them again? But you're, but you're partially right. It has to deal with money. I'm not going to pay them more. And you're not going to pay them more. Absolutely not. So how are you using money to get the attorney to do what they were supposed to? As evidence. I don't know. Threaten to sue? Like, I don't you do threaten them. And how do you threaten to hit them where it hurts in their wallet? How do you, how, you put the attorney, uh, you file a formal complaint against the attorney with those who manage their license. Who do attorneys get licensed through? The bar, the bar association. And anytime an attorney has, I think it's like three or more complaints against them, on their license, their errors and emissions insurance gets goes up through the roof. It gets expensive because there's a lot of complaints that need to be uh, litigated and then the insurance needs to deal with, right? But check this out. She went to file that complaint. It cost you $3,000 to file a complaint against an attorney. Oh my God. Yep. 
the bar association charges three grand to try to file a complaint against an attorney. It's bullshit. What a rigged system, huh? Yeah. So two years later, somehow she managed her, she had her current attorney somehow managed to fix the uh, issue up and resolve it. Uh, because look, I, I gave her another advice before it came to any of that. I told her, why don't you just contact the um, the mortgage company who was supposed to have filed the satisfaction of lien in the first place, you know, and have them file that satisfaction that they obviously never did because they were paid off. They could just look at their records, right? That's the part. That's the first part I should have told you in this story. Um, they went out of business. That's why she wasn't able to get in touch with them to have them fill out the paperwork, file the paperwork. Uh, that the loan was paid off and satisfied because they went out of business. So then you try to go back to your, you know, title insurance and all that, you know, that's how you start working it back. So it was a mess of a situation. It took her two years to sell that property. The first buyer dropped out. She had to put it back on the market, find another buyer, another buyer dropped out. You know, by the time the third buyer, I think rolled around, she was able to clear it up and then close on the property. But see, title work can be nasty business because who wants to buy a property where the, where the ownership cannot be easily transferred, right? Who wants to buy a property where uh, it has outstanding liens on it? Even though you know they've been paid off, but you can't prove it. You're going to have that same problem trying to sell a property when you go to try to sell it, right? So it's, you, you want to make sure the seller clears up any of those problems. And lastly, we have a Torin certificate which is not used in New Jersey. So you highlighted all these in that list, uh, those four things on the list there, abstract of title with attorney's opinion, a certificate of title, a title insurance policy and torrent certificate. And next to torrent certificate, I want you to use not, I want you to write not used in New Jersey. Cause it will still be on exam. You need to know the four evidences or four proofs of ownership or evidences of title. What are the four evidences of title? Abstract of title with attorney's opinion, certificate of title, title insurance policy, and Torin certificate. Is a deed proof of ownership? No. Nope. No, it's a document that's used to transfer ownership, but it's not proof of ownership. I could, I could, I'm gonna show you right now. I'm going to show you right now that a deed is not proof of ownership. And I'm going to make it so clear to you guys that it is not proof of ownership by how, do, how am I going to how am I going to manage to do that? Hmm. I'm going to manage to do that by showing you Let's see. Give me one second. Doop -de -doop -de -doo. Doop -de -doo. I got a quick claim deed here right in front of you is uh, because I have a deed, does that mean that I have the right to sell your property? Can you transfer an ownership with a quit claim deed? Yeah. What's that? Yes. yes, you can. Yes. Mm-hmm. You could transfer the ownership of a property through a quick claim deed. That is true. Um, and with a quick claim deed, you don't even need to be a, the owner to sign it. So I'm going to open up a bargain and sale deed. We're going to go a little bit different from my example here.
here's a here's a bargain and sale CAG or CVG type deed, Covenants Against Grantors Act type deed. In in this type of deed, I could fill it out that I'm the seller, you're the buyer, or you're the seller and I'm the buyer, what have you. Um, or I'm the seller and somebody else is the buyer. But do I have the right to sell your property? Am I the true grantor? No. Okay. Um, yeah. So because I got a blank deed and because I filled out a deed saying that I'm the owner of the property and that I'm selling it to somebody else, does it make it a valid deed? No. So that is why a deed is not proof of title. It's just a document that's used to transfer ownership. It doesn't prove that I have the legal right to transfer it in the first place. Abstract of title with attorney's opinion. We already went over that. Title insurance policy. I already explained that for you how that works. Certificate of title. I explained that to you. That's often uh, oral or implied by an attorney where they search the public records, okay? So we have these slides here that I went over. Now, each one of these, I already explained them to you here. We went over this list, but then I explained them. Here's it. Uh, here's just the slides with the explanation a little bit more here for you, okay? It's the same thing that I explained to you. Certificate of title. and a Torrin certificate, which is not used in New Jersey. A Torrin certificate, some states have a Torrin system, but basically it's a central registry of record keeping. Then any, anytime there's a transfer of ownership, it must be done at that central hall of record keeping. In New Jersey, do you have to record the deed in the public record? No, in a Torrin system, you do. We don't have Torrin, we don't use Torrin systems in New Jersey. We have 21 counties in New Jersey where we record our documents for uh, if your property is located in that county. It's uh, where do we keep your, uh, your documents pertaining to ownership? It's in the county hall of records, which is usually the county courthouse. All right, but it doesn't need to be recorded there. So here's that once again, that uh, the slide that you guys have seen many times throughout this, uh, book. I put this slide in a couple chapters. Title is just a word that means ownership. There's no document in real estate called title. It's just a word that means ownership. So how do we transfer ownership? By deed. Personal property is transferred by bill of sale. Deed is how we transfer real property ownership, right? So there's two ways of explaining uh, what a deed does. A deed is a document used to transfer ownership, rights or interest, but is not proof of ownership. This is the dumbed down definition, the, the simple stupid definition. Another way of saying the same exact thing is a deed is an instrument used to convey title, but is not evidence of title, okay? And as you can see here, you know, I got these words down here. Uh, document used. Okay, so document is another word for instrument. Transfer is another word for convey. Title is another word for ownership. Evidence is another word for proof. Now, I think I got a better version of this slide that I created in the previous chapter. What's another chapter that we talked about deeds and titles? Uh, you know what? I know we talked about it in chapter five, but let me go to chapter five uh, slideshow for a second and grab that slide from there. I have a little better, uh, I got a better slide for it there. I just want to pull up and add to this slideshow. Chapter five, I believe it was. We talked about the word title.
Sorry, just bear with me one second here. Is that update? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Here we go. There we go. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, uh, yeah, I like the new definite, the new slide better. Okay, so here we go. Here's the new slide. I just updated that slideshow, so that's good. Let me close my chapter five slideshow, and here we go. You guys can see the slide. Yes. Yeah. So here, I just, as you can see, this is, I just replaced this slide with, uh, with another one. It, it's pretty much got the same things, but I got, I changed it a little bit. Uh, title is a word that means ownership. There's no document in real estate called title. Deed, uh, explained on page 325, there's two different ways to define what a deed is, but saying the same exact thing. A deed is a document used to transfer ownership, but it's not proof of ownership. You know what, let's, let's just add the word deed there here. Deed is a document used to transfer ownership but is not proof of ownership. Deed is an instrument used to convey title but is not evidence of title. Which one sounds more educated? Which one sounds like you know really what, that you've been in the business for a while, you know what you're talking about? The second one, right? Mm -hmm. But they're saying the same exact thing. Look, document means instrument. Transfer means convey. Proof, another word for proof is evidence. Another word for ownership is title. Right, so it's saying the same exact thing, and the way the, uh, the second way is the way that they're going to word it on exams. Okay, a deed is an instrument used to convey title, but is not evidence of title. All right, so a deed's also used to transfer one's right, inch, or interest in real property, such as air rights, mineral rights, subsurface rights, or a partial ownership. You do it through some sort of deed of conveyance. So. A deed is not always just used to transfer ownership. It could be used to transfer one's right, uh, uh, rights, interest, uh, or title in real property. So the ownership's transferred upon delivery and acceptance of the deed itself. Delivery and acceptance of the signed deed delivered to the buyer. Recording a document into the public record um, it's always a good idea to record your deed in the public record uh, to prevent situations where you may have a nefarious seller who sells you their property in the morning and gives you the deed and names you the deed, uh, the buyer in the deed. And then later in the afternoon, they write another deed and they sell it to somebody else. Who's the owner? Are both deeds valid? Yes. So who's the owner? The one that's recorded. The one who records their document in a public record first. Right. Right. So um, there's more reasons why you would want to record your deed in the public record. Let's see if I have them here in the slideshow. Yeah. All right. Um, more reasons why you would want to record your deed in a public record is what if the uh, somebody slips and falls on the property now? The seller wants to make sure that their deed is record th that the deed is recorded in a public record reflecting the new owner, so that they don't get sued. Because the person that would get sued would be would be the one who's listed in a public record as still being the owner, right? And the, and the buyer would want to make sure that their interest is recorded, that they're now the buyer of the, they're now the owner of the property. So, because what if the seller now has some outstanding debts or lawsuits? Somebody searches the public record, they could see that they're still listed as the owner of the property. 
they could they could create a lien on that property even though they're not the owner anymore because they're uh, that has not been changed in the public record so it's in all parties interest to make sure that their change of ownership has been recorded make sense yes and once again, here are the four evidences of title. So actually, this is a good slide to study. Three, two, one, changing slide now. Okay, marketable or merchantable title. Hmm. Well, let's get caught up. Underneath uh, evidences of title, let's highlight a deed is not proof of title. At the bottom of the page under abstract of title with attorney's opinion, we're gonna highlight on page 349 at the bottom, we're gonna highlight an abstract of title is a brief history of the instruments appearing in the county record that affect title to a parcel of real estate property. A brief history that should be condensed history. Let me make that note. Page All right, sorry about that. Okay, so you're highlighting uh, abstract of title is a right in there condensed history instead of a brief history. Uh, and then highlight uh, of, of the instruments appearing in the county record that affect title to the parcel in question. All right, uh, turn a page. Page 350. Well, they talk about uh, title insurance, torrent certificate, certificate of title. On page 351, marketable or merchantable title. You're gonna highlight marketable or merchantable title is one that is free from significant defects other than those that the buyer has agreed to accept. Can you buy a property that has uh, encumbrances on it or defects in the title? Sure you can. Why would you want to though, right? So as a buyer, you'd wanna make sure the seller clears them up before you buy the property. And how would you discover that there's a problem with the title? Title search. Title search, okay. I'm just asking you guys to make sure that you're following along, okay? Um, so marketable just means that something is sellable, right? So sure, you could buy a property that's got problems. Can you buy a car that's got all that's all banged up? Sure. Why would you want to? Okay. Well, if the juice is worth the squeeze, maybe. <laughs> Look, uh, if you got a property, it's got a lien on it. If you if there's a three hundred thousand dollar property, and there's a twenty five thousand dollar lien on it, would you want to buy that property without that lien being cleared up? Right. If the price is right. Sell it to me for two seventy five. dollars I'm still paying $300,000 in the end of the day, right? Right. 
So um, yeah, if it's if if it's if it's worth it, and if I want to deal with the problem. Okay, uh, the purchaser can be assured against having to defend the title, and it's useful to buy title insurance policy as well. But marketable, what is merchantable or marketable title? It means that it's sellable. Okay, but can you buy a property that has defects in it? Yes, you can. If the property is so banged up that it's got so many defects in it that nobody's willing to buy it, it's said that you do not have marketable title. We just want you to understand the lingo here. Now, closing the transaction at the bottom of page 351. Um, loan dispersal, of the mortgage funds in exchange for the note. So the note is the financing instrument. You guys recall that from the chapter, was that 13, I believe, or 14? Um, I believe, yeah, one of those chapters. The note, there's two parts of a mortgage. One is the note, it's the financing instrument, and the mortgage itself is the security instrument. It's the promise to pay, which I should have that listed here as security instrument being the promise to pay. Mortgage is the security. It's the promise to pay. All right, so two transactions actually take place at closing. I say usually, because what if somebody's buying all cash? Then, then two transactions are not taking place. Uh, when they're purchasing with a mortgage loan, not cash, all right? Not cash. So you have the closing of the sale where the seller delivers the deed in exchange for the purchase price, right? The seller delivers good title by deed and property is delivered in promised condition. The time uh, as that they wrote in the purchase contract. And the closing of the buyer's loan. That's a transaction all in its own, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you go through a whole process to try to get a loan. That's a whole transaction in its own. But this is an exam question for you guys. It's a little wacky exam question, but anyway, you could get an exam question and ask you, you know, um, what are the, there's two transactions that usually take place at closing. What are they? One, the closing of the sale, where the seller delivers the deed in exchange for the purchase price. And the other one is uh, if the purchase price is coming through a loan, they got to close the loan. The loan is a transaction all into itself. So let's, let's go down to the second paragraph under closing the transaction. And... Uh, Let's underline, a deed is delivered in exchange for the purchase price. And draw an arrow down to number two, the closing of the sale. Because that's describing what the closing of the sale is, right? The deed is delivered in exchange for the purchase price. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yep, yep. All right, and then the highlight, the closing of the buyer's loan. And then go above that and after the first thing that you highlighted there, you're gonna highlight in many sales transactions, two closings actually take place at this time. One is the closing of the buyer's loan and two is the closing of the sale where the deed is delivered in exchange for the purchase price. I believe that's the way they worded on exam hint hint. All right, turn the page. Lender's interest at closing. The lender has a lot of interest. They want to make sure the buyers obtain the homeowner's insurance policy. Our job as real estate agents is to ensure that a couple of weeks before the closing that our buyers try to get homeowner's insurance. They're not gonna close without it. 
the lender will not give them the, uh, the release of funds to the buyer to purchase the property if they did not prove that they have homeowner's insurance, which protects the lender. Homeowner's insurance protects who? The lender. The lender. If the lender's requiring it, it's because it's protecting them. It's protecting their collateral for the money that they're lending you. They're lending you the money to buy the house. So they wanna make sure if that house burns down tomorrow that they get their money back. And how do you do that? Through insurance, homeowner's insurance. But the, but the lender is listed as the payee, okay? Now, uh, a certificate of occupancy, if required, the lender's gonna want a copy of that. They're also gonna want the fire inspection certificates. Um, you know, for showing that they have the uh, carbon monoxide detectors, smoke alarms and fire extinguishers, et cetera, if required, and there are required. They, at minimum, they can't require a home inspection, but they could require at minimum a wood destroying insect report to make sure that the property that they're lending you the money to buy is not being overrun by termites and about to collapse. Mm. Flood insurance, if it's in a flood zone, if it's in a 100 year flood zone, flood insurance is required. It's normally not required if it's in a 500 year flood zone, which what does that mean? If it's in a 100 year flood zone, that means that it's the property is likely to flood at least once every 100 years. If it's in a 500 year flood zone, it means that it's likely to flood at least once every 500 years. And if you want to find out if a property is in a flood zone or not, here's a link I have directly to the FEMA flood map search. But the way to ensure that whether you need flood insurance or not, there's only one way. It's not to ask the seller if they have it, because you know what? Flood maps get redrawn. The seller may not have been required to. It wasn't listed as a flood zone, but now it is. Um, the only one true way, I mean, you could search these FEMA maps but they also got supplemental materials that may say that the maps are getting redrawn and stuff. It could be kind of complicated for us to read to, to ascertain definitively of whether you're in a flood zone or not. Ask the buyer's lender, their mortgage company. They'll tell you if it's in a flood zone or not. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes they're wrong. And if they're wrong and you, you're certain that it's not in a flood zone, well, how could you prove that? survey. Yep. You do a survey elevation study. You get an elevation report. If you're going to object to whether a property is in a flood zone or not, uh, you'll get an elevation report uh, from the surveyor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here, let, let, let's add that as something here as a little notation, shall we? Um, hmm. What did I say? What did I just say there to uh, to argue to uh, dispute? All right. Mm -mm. We don't need a bullet. Let's and boom. All right. And if you click on this, if you guys have ever been there, I'm not sure if I took you guys ever here before or not, but I will now. You can search the FEMA website. This is the FEMA website, direct link to whether you put in a property address here to find out if the property is in a flood zone or not. Okay. Here, I'll, I'll put in an old property that I used to own.
because I know it's in a flood zone now. Because it was 15 feet underwater after I sold it. Look at that. It looks like it's right on the edge. But I tell you what, if you're that close to that much blue, <laughs> you're probably in a flood zone. All right. And I know that definitely requires flood insurance. Look, you could just look at the colors. Look at it. Annual chance, annual chance of a flood hazard. That's in a brown zone over there. Look at that. Oops. Uh, actually, I'm in the I'm both in the green and the brown there. You see that? Or I was. That means if you're looking at the colors here, it's a 0.2% annual chance of flood hazard of 1% annual chance of flood with a depth of less than one foot or with an area of less than one, whatever. Either way, that's a flood zone. You're near that blue, you're near that brown, you're in a flood zone. Look at it, when it's zoomed out like that, you're in water. Area of minimal flood zone, but either way, it is a flood zone, nonetheless. So buyer needs to get flood insurance if it's in a flood zone. Uh, and buyers are going to need to know that because we need to make sure they get the flood insurance. Otherwise, they won't be able to get the loan to close, right? Yeah. All right. So I want you guys to go to page 353, and we're going to highlight uh, the uh, federal real estate settlement a lot of this stuff we already went over previously, but the Federal Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, RESPA, formerly administered by HUD, is now administered by the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It was created to ensure that the buyer and seller in residential real estate transactions have knowledge of all the settlement costs. Okay. Um, then we're going to go underneath the, it says, we're not highlighting this, but it says RESPA requirements apply when the purchase is financed by a federally related loan. What is a federally related loan? Um, when the banks or lenders money is, or, the, or deposits are insured by federal agencies, the FDIC or FSLIC. If they're insured by the FHA or guaranteed by the VA if they're made by the RECD, the Farmer Home Loan Association, or administered by HUD, or intended to be sold by the lender to Fannie Mae, Ginny Mae, or Freddie Mac. Highlight RESPA regulations apply only to transactions involving new first mortgage loans. Basically, that means not for refinancing, just for loans to purchase real estate. And then we're going to highlight in that list, section eight prohibits against kickbacks. Because that's an exam question sooner than later, hint, hint. And even though it says section nine of RESPA law prohibits lenders from requiring that you use a particular title company, highlight section 10, lenders are required to maintain an escrow are not required to maintain escrow accounts to fund property taxes and insurance. However, if they do, they're limited in how much that they could charge that borrower in advance to hold into the escrow account. So highlight at the bottom, at least once a year, the lender must return overages of $50 or more. I believe that's an exam question. Turn the page. All right, closing disclosure, the CD, we already have this stuff down. Remember we did this, we, we instead of jumping around all over the place and going over it again and again in every chapter, we already went over all this stuff uh, at ad nauseum, right? Remember, the CD is the closing disclosure. TRID is that uh, Kila Respa integrated disclosure uh, statement. And closing disclosure, that's the actual numbers uh, for accounting for all the pennies in the closing, uh, accounting in the closing, right? 
Um, and the, the CD has to be given to the buyer and the, and the seller within three business days of the closing. Uh, the LE, now what, what does the CD replace? What document does the closing disclosure, the CD replace? The HUD-1 RESPA statement. And what is RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act? What is the purpose of that closing statement or closing disclosure? To ensure that the parties in the transactions have knowledge of all settlement costs, as we've seen on that previous slide. Take, take a picture of the slide, study the slide. Trid requirements, the CD replaces the, uh, uh, the HUD one, the L, uh, and it must be given three days before closing with at least seven business days between the issuance of the LE and the closing. Uh, the borrower should compare the loan estimate to the actual closing document. What does the LE replace? What document does the LE, the loan estimate, replace? Good faith. The good faith estimate, the GFE, correct. And that has to be given to the borrower within three days of their completed loan application, which is when? Before closing. When the aliens have landed. Remember when the aliens are present? That's when the borrower completed their loan application. The LE has to be given within three days of the completed loan application. All right. So uh, coming up next slides, okay. Ba -ba -ba -ba. So affidavit of title. Let's go to page 360. And I want you to put a highlighted, uh, I want you to highlight in the second paragraph under the title procedure, highlight affidavit of title on the first line in the second paragraph. And above that, I want you to write signed by the seller. And then highlight everything after affidavit of uh, title in that paragraph or put a highlighted box around the remaining of it. You need to know what affidavit of title is. It will be on exams. So, when do we do a title search? The title search can be done weeks before the closing. And why do we do a title search? Make sure there's no liens or. Make sure there's no liens or encumbrances on a property, right? Yes. What about that gap in time from the time they do the title search and the time we get to closing? Could there be liens attached to the property then? Yes. Could issues come up then? Yes. Well, you know what? The buyer's insured because they got the insurance. They got title insurance. Mm. So the insurance company's taking a risk there. So the insurance company in that gap of time between the time they did the search and the closing. So at the moment of closing, they have the seller sign a document called an affidavit of title. This is where the seller is swearing that they've had no judgments or no unpaid contractors for repairs or improvements. They have not filed for bankruptcy and the seller's in possession of the premises. And by doing this, the title company obtains the right to sue the seller if they lied or if any of their statements prove untrue. So after all conditions are met, the closing agent or title company disperses the purchase price to the seller. Seller gives the keys and the original CO and fire inspection certificate to the buyer and the deed that's signed. And then the deed gets recorded. The seller records the fact that they're no longer the owner and they're responsible for those expenses and the buyer records their new deed and they're responsible for that expense, 
okay? Uh, so the buyer records and pays for recording expenses uh, into their, uh, putting the property into their name and uh, issuing the first lien uh, to their lender, right? And the seller records uh, for that showing that they're no longer the owner of the property and that all their liens have been paid off. Their satisfaction of lien, they're responsible for paying for that recording. All right, escrow closing is a neutral third party closing where everybody's not sitting across the table from each other. Tra traditional closings, everybody's sitting at, the, you got the buyer and the seller and their attorneys and their real estate agents all sitting around the table. Um, an escrow closing is one where the seller may show up earlier in the day or even a day in advance and they sign all the documents they drop off the keys to the property uh, and the original uh, fire and, and uh, uh, cert and their uh, CO. And uh, after the buyers come and they signed all their documents later on uh, for their mortgage and brought the payments and any other additional money, we as real estate agents, don't forget that they gave you a deposit money that your broker's holding. You need to get you need to arrange days before the closing. You got to let your broker know you need that deposit money, how much deposit that they're holding uh, and what it's for and, you, uh, and who, it's, who they're supposed to make the deposit check out to. It's going to be the closing agent, whoever that is. You need to let your broker know who that is so that they could write uh, a check from the escrow account for the closing, giving that buyer's money, that deposit money. Don't just go showing up to closing saying, hey, where's my commission? And you're not, and, and you didn't bring the seller, the buyer's money that they gave to you to hold on to. Do not forget that. That would be an embarrassing moment for you. You guys there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And it has happened. I've had it happen. Every agent has it happen to him at some point. And it is embarrassing when it does happen. Okay. So try to. Uh, make a list to try to prevent that from happening. Put that on your checklist, you know. Make sure you bring the buyer's check to closing. Yeah. Okay. Don't just go there with your hand out expecting them to give you money and you didn't bring theirs. They could be rushing back. You're like, oh my God, I hope the broker's still at the office. I need them to write the check. Oh my God, we need to do the closing. Because if they're not there, nobody can write that check. We got issues. Okay. All right, so Closing an escrow is a closing done by a neutral third party who hands over the keys and the money after both parties uh, perform their obligations. All right, preparation of the closing statements. Will the seller, uh, this obviously, um, the broker's commission, attorney's fees, recording expenses, realty transfer tax, it's a sales tax when you're selling your property, it's paid for by the seller. So these are expenses that are prepared this one's paid by the seller, the commission. Attorney's fees, well, each party pays for their own attorney fee. Recording expenses, each party pays their own recording expenses. The realty transfer tax is always paid for by the seller, and that's coming up. Title expenses, they're paid for by the buyer. Loan fees, they're paid by the buyer. Tax reserves and insurance reserves, the escrow account, that's paid for by the buyer. Any additional mortgage-related fees are paid by the buyer. Appraisal fees are paid by seller. buyer. Survey fees are paid by the buyer. It's an inspection. Buyer. The seller don't care uh, what the issues are. The buyer does. If the buyer wants to find out about them, these are inspections, right? The appraisal, the survey. Prorations. We're going to learn. We have one more math problem to do, guys. And that's going to be prorations. Uh, we'll, we'll probably get a proration of uh, taxes problem. So I'm going to do a proration tax problem with you guys uh, because you will get one of those on state exam without a doubt. So what are prorations? They're the final adjustments for any expenses. The expenses are uh, fairly divided between the seller and the buyer. So accrued items are credits to the buyer and prepaid items are credits to the seller. Right. Who, who gets a credit at the closing? Whoever paid for it, whatever it may be. 
That's the way I remember it. And if you study this, if you guys remember this, no matter how they word it on exam, you'll get the question right, okay? So what is a credit? A credit is amount that's entered into one's favor. A debit is an amount that somebody owes. And arrears is a payment that's due at the end of a period. Okay. Just think about your rear. Arrears. Where's your rear? At the end, in the behind, right? So at the end of a period for which something is owed, behind, after, after you, right, is your rear, right? It's after you. So at the end, in the arrears, it's after the end of which a period is, is something is owed. Um, so who gets a credit at closing? Well, whoever paid for it, whatever it may be. If you guys remember this question and this answer, and you recite that to yourself when you're given a question on state exam or school exam, you'll never get it wrong. Because otherwise you'll start overthinking it and you will get it wrong every time. Well, a lot of times. But it's really a simple question. Who gets a credit at closing? Well, it depends. What are we talking about? Credit for what? Taxes? Well, who pays the taxes? The owner of the property, right? Well, they prepaid those taxes. You get pre you pay the taxes for the coming quarter, right? What if they're selling the property before the end of the quarter? They're going to have to get some money back for the time that they're not going to be living there that they prepaid in advance, right? 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 Okay. Now, escrow deposits, they're paid by the buyer or they get credited to the buyer. Prepaid taxes get credited to the seller. Remaining heating oil in the tank, if, it's, if the house is heated by oil, well, it's always a good job if you're the seller's agent to get them a little bit more money because they may not be thinking about this. You contact the seller. If you're a good agent, you could get them a couple hundred bucks. That oil is not cheap that heats their, that heats their house. There's a, they may have a couple hundred gallon oil tank in the basement there or in the ground. And if they paid and they have that tank filled, we need to find out how much oil is remaining in that tank. And that buyer needs to reimburse the seller for the heating fuel that they paid for in advance. See, it's a little bit different when you have gas. If you have gas, you use it and then you pay for it. You get the bill in the arrears, right? After you used it. Whereas oil, you have to order it and pay for it in advance before you use it. So we need to get their, uh, their oil delivery company to come out. They put a stick in the oil tank. They measure how many gallons of oil is left in there. And the buyer is going to have to cut them a check for whatever the going price of oil is on the day of closing for that many gallons. And if the taxes have not been paid, well, then the buyer's going to get a credit because they're going to have to pay it before they could close. And then the, but they're not living there for that time. So they're going to have to get it prorated. So we're going to do a math problem on prorations. Now the realty transfer fee or tax is always paid by the seller in a transaction. Before we get to this, let's go down to how the closing statement works on page 361. And highlight a debit is a charge or amount that the party being debited owes and must pay at the closing. A credit is an amount entered into a person's favor, either amount that the party already paid or an amount that the party must be reimbursed for. And, and what, what you should write at the bottom of the, at the bottom of the page is this, who gets a credit at closing? Whoever paid for it, whatever it may be. It's the easiest way to remember it.
Now, whoever gets that credit, the exceptions to that would be uh, a rent or security deposits, right? That are paid by a tenant. However, they still get prorated. Because when does the tenant pay the rent to the landlord? Usually, when does the tenant pay the rent? The to first the of the month. The first of the month. But if you got the closing in the middle of the month, does the landlord get, does the seller get to keep all the money that was paid to them at the beginning of the month? No. no, we're going to have to prorate it. We're going to have to divide that rent by the number of days in the month and the number of days remaining in the month, the seller is going to have, the buyer is going to have to get uh, paid for that. And uh, the buyer is going to have to get all of the security deposits that are being held uh, for any renters because they're going to have to return that money to the renters, right? If there was no damages when they move out. Okay, so the realty transfer tax now. I'm going to turn to page 362. Under transfer tax, at the bottom of the page, we're going to highlight the realty transfer tax is always charged to the seller in a real estate transaction. And here's the one where I put a couple of uh, uh, calculators. I got links to the calculators here on a couple of websites. Um, there's Realty Tax, uh, New Jersey Realtor, uh, the New Jersey Counting. Uh, there's a calculator here for NJ County Recording. Uh, the County Clerk's Office in Union County has a cal calculator. Let me check this one out. I, never, I don't think I looked at that one. These are all links that I put here for you guys that I looked up. All right. You want to know how much the seller pays in a property tax? Well, if you use on page 363, there is a chart here. You guys see the chart on page 363? Yes. All right. So this is how you calculate how much tax that the seller has to pay at closing. Let me see if I have this chart here in the slideshow at all. No, I don't. All right, so it works like this. Um, I want you to draw a line down, uh, down, the down the center, straight down the center, separating the left side and the right side of that chart. And then I want you to draw, uh, I basically want you to make a cross separating the top from the bottom where it says uh, senior citizens, blind persons, disabled, uh, and low income. Cross out moderate income. Moderate income, is, they pay, they're the top part of the chart, okay? So the left side of the chart is for properties under $350,000, under and including $350,000. And the right side of the chart is the figures that they would pay uh, for properties over $350,000 in one penny. And the, um, the bottom part of the chart is for uh, poor persons and disabled and blind people and seniors. And then all the way down at the bottom of the chart, it says paid by the buyer. I want you to highlight for real property zoned for residential use whether improved or not. If the purchase price is equal to or greater than $1 million, the buyer will pay a fee of 1% of the purchase price. And I want you to write this there right after that, mansion tax, because that's what it's called. It's called the mansion tax. Now, 
this was one of those taxes that we put on the uh, uh, on the election ballots. You know, when you vote for uh, in the primaries or in presidential elections, they got those public option questions that they put on the side. Years ago, they put this as a public option question when they introduce a new tax. You know, politicians don't want to say, hey, we are the ones that created the tax. So instead, they, they put it on the ballot for the taxpayer to vote whether they want a new tax created or not. Now, who in their right mind would want a, a new tax? Well, if they phrase it in a way that it sounds like you'll never pay it. Because look, in our climate all the time, don't people always say, hey, screw the rich man, let them pay their fair share, right? I'm never gonna own a million dollar property. That's only for those rich people. You know what, screw them, let them pay a 1% of the purchase price as a tax when they buy a property. Now, they didn't even explain what they're gonna do with that money, the politicians. They just said it's gonna go into a general fund and then they could piss it away however they want. But yet we, the taxpayers in New Jersey voted for it. Why? Because of all this animosity for people who have money. I don't get it, you know? I'm not a millionaire, but you know what? I, I, I say more power to you. You know what, if you hit the lottery or if you, if you work hard and you become a millionaire, I say good for you, you know? You should keep your money. Government should, should have keep our hands out of our pockets. But yet you get a lot of people that are angry and bitter and they're just like, oh yeah, let's, let's vote for a 1% mansion tax. I'll never pay that. Let me ask you a question. We already read about subdivisions, right? Yes. When you do a subdivision, when a builder does a subdivision, you think they didn't spend at least a million dollars on all that land that they're gonna build all them homes on? They probably did. So they have to pay a 1% mansion tax because it says even if it's raw land, they have to pay that tax. So if they got to pay that tax, you think that they're going to eat that cost or you think they're not going to build it into the sales price of each individual home that they sell? Yeah. Even if it's affordable housing. So when you voted to stick it to the man, the rich man, Who'd you really stick it to? I know some of you probably didn't vote for that because you're too young for that, but you know, some of you did. And if you ever voted to pass that mansion tax, you voted to stick it to yourself. <laughs> Karma's a bitch, ain't it? <laughs> Uh, that's a perfect example of it too, right? I suggested you guys, if you don't know all the details behind something, listen, don't be bitter, first of all. You know, think about karma. What comes around goes around, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wish people to be successful. I wish all of you are successful. I wish all of you do better in real estate than I ever did. I wish you guys do are superstars, right? Um, I wish you guys are become millionaires, okay? Um, I wish you well. I'm not going to wish you to pay any taxes. I want you to pay less taxes. All right. Hey, we, Victor. Yeah. Does that ever, or have you ever seen that change? Like as property values rise over the years, does that million ever go up in value or is that, is that staying stagnant as values increase? So then more people are actually paying that tax. The karma just keeps coming and coming. Yeah. Because there's more millionaires now than ever before. Well, no, he's making a good point. You know, they voted for this years ago to, to raise this 1% because who's, who's going to ever own a million dollars? Well, these days in New Jersey, you know what? It's not out of the ordinary to have a lot of million dollar homes or close to it anyway, right? So when you got these properties out there like that, more some of these people that may have voted for this mansion tax are really regretting that decision these days. Now they got it when they buy a property, a million dollars or more, even if it's raw land, they need to pay 1% of the purchase price mm. as a tax. All right. Um, so here's the way that it works. You have the chart on the left-hand side of the chart is for properties under 350,000. If you're buying a property for $150,000, how much are you going to pay in the, as a seller on the realty transfer fee? You're going to pay $2 for every $500 of value. 
So to figure that out, you just do 150,000 divided by 500. How many times does $500 go into 150,000? 300 times. 300 times $2, the realty transfer fee is $600 for a $150,000 home. But there ain't a whole lot of them around. So let's see, um, what if it was a $200,000 home? Ah, you don't just jump to the second tier where it's $3.35 for, for $500 of value. For the first $150,000, it's gonna be $600. And then for the amount between 150,000 and a penny to 200,000 is how much is in there? $50,000, right? So for that next $50,000 divided by 500, it goes in 100 times. 100 times 335 is $335. So now add the 600 from the first tier to the 335, and they would pay a $935 transfer fee on a $200,000 home. Now you may say people should be paying more money if they have more money, right? Well, let's look to the right side of the chart. They have a different figure altogether. For the first $150,000, they're not paying $2 for every $500 of value. They're paying $2.90 for the first $500 of value. So they are paying more. And for the next $50,000, they're not paying $3.35. They're paying $4.25. Uh, per $500 and so on and so forth. And the amounts go up and up from there. Um, so anyway, we don't need to do this for, uh, for exams, but if you ever want to create a new calculator for yourselves for your websites, you can probably download them, but you, now you know the formulas and how you could do it. And I have these links here on this slideshow that show you um, uh, the, the state's taxation website where if they ever update these numbers, you could update them and get the latest info from. And then I have the, uh, the realty transfer calculator right here. So if you buy a house for $300,000 or, or $200,000, let's use these examples from the book here. Uh, calculate additional transfer fee. What's that about? I don't know. Deed, no exemptions, regular. Calculate it. $935. Isn't that what we said? Now, what if that person is blind or disabled? Do they get any discount? Yeah, they pay a different amount altogether, 275. Okay. So here's just some links here uh, for these calculators online. But who pays the realty transfer fee? You need to know that for exam. Guys? Oh, you asking seller. <laughs> the seller, the seller pays it. Okay, uh, we're, we're at the end of the class right now, but we need to finish this. So we're gonna go just a little bit longer to finish this, okay? That's okay, okay. thank you. All right, so the arithmetic of prorations, yearly charge is divided by 360 day year. That's based on 30 day months. And monthly charges are divided by the actual number of days in the month. So, but for state exam, it's a little bit different. When you do the state exam, we don't know what year it is. We're not gonna be assuming that it's a leap year. Does February have 29 days or 28 days? Instead, you're gonna base it off of 360 day calendar year, which means every month has 30 days in it, okay? So how do, here's a little tip for you guys, by the way, in normal life, when you're not taking exams, how do you remember which months have more than 30 days or less than 30 days? There's actually a little nursery rhyme that goes with this. I'm not gonna play that for you. Um, but you can look at your knuckles, like you're seeing right here. Every knuckle is a hill, right? And the hill is, uh, is where you have more than 30 days in the month. And the valley, in between your knuckles is where you have less than 30 days, okay? Now, if you're only using one hand and not, you're not putting the two hands next to each other, well, you see there's two knuckles back to back. 
So what you could do is if you're going January, February, March, April, May, June, July, and then you could work it back again, August, September, October, November, December. Okay. Uh, that's the way that you could work it. It's with one hand. Anyway, it's a little tip, little trick. Okay. And here's the little nursery rhyme to, that I was never taught in because apparently my public education sucked in uh, preschool or uh, kindergarten. Yeah. I don't know. Some of you, did any of you ever learn this in school? Yes. Well, you must have had a better school. No. Because I never I <laughs> Yeah. I was always wondering. I, I always got to check the calendar because I don't know. Yeah. But they give you this little thing. 30 days hath September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except February, which has 28 days and 29 each leap year, which is every four years, by the way. All right. Anybody here born on February 29th? No. Oh my gosh, see you stay young forever, right? You age, you, you age like a dog once every four years, right? <laughs> I, you know, I had an uncle that was born on February 29th, anyway. All right, so uh, preparation of closing statements. Uh, we already said the unpaid principal balance of the outstanding mortgage being assumed by a buyer, if being assumed. Interest on existing mortgage not paid, buyer's earnest money, okay. These are just a bunch of the uh, unpaid water bills, real estate taxes in the years, whatever, whatever, whatever. Sales price, fuel oil on hand, I already talked about that. Insurance and tax reserves, refund of water charges. If you guys want to be good agents and you're working with a buyer to purchase a house, you want to know how to save them a lot of money? Yeah. Okay. You need to find out for them who the utility companies are for the electric, the, the sewer, uh, I'm sorry, the electric, the, um, uh, the water, uh, gas, and get the meter numbers and such, or at least the, uh, or, or you could use the address in some cases, but you really should have the meter numbers too. No, well, and, and you contact, I sent you the thing. You, you have the buyer uh, contact uh, the utility you company. On everything. Did you see the actual drafting chart? Or no? Hold on, hold on, let me mute the people here. Okay, so you have the uh, you have the buyer um, contact those utility companies and transfer the utilities into their name on the day of closing. If they do that, then they won't experience a cutoff in uh, services, or have to pay sometimes hundreds of dollars in connection fees, uh, and have to wait for the an appointment uh, for the utility companies to come out and turn the water back on, to turn the gas back on, to turn the electric back on, you know? So basically they experience no loss of services and the, the, they'll do the final meter readings so that they're not gonna get billed for the previous owner's um, expenses, okay? It's important to get that done. If you do that, you're a good agent and you're saving your clients a lot of aggravation and money, okay? All right, arrears, we already went over this again. Let's highlight it on page 264 under prorations in the second paragraph. You guys see the word arrears in bold? Arrears is at the end of a period for which it is due. A lot of this stuff we already explained, turn to page 360, uh, 366. And under the closing, you guys are gonna highlight the seller's attorney is responsible for all the details of the transaction that concern the title to the property. That statement will help you on school exam. So such as preparing the deed and making sure that the prior liens have been paid and such, okay? It's the buyer's, it's the seller's attorney's responsibility for making sure that issues are taken care of. It's the buyer's attorney's responsibility for discovering issues. Make sense? You're the buyer. Your representative is responsible for finding problems. The seller's representative 
attorney is responsible for clearing them up. All right, so basically I got that breakdown here in this slideshow. Here. All right. Make sure that you also send your commission bill to the closing agents weeks before the closing so that they could figure it out into the calculations how much commission you guys are going to get paid. And then make sure you bring that bill with you to closing to make sure it matches up with what's on the closing statement. All right. That's the end of the slideshow, but we got a math problem still to do. So we're going to do that math problem right now. And I'm going to also read to you a humorous email that's related uh, to this uh, topic here. Okay. So let me close this out. And let me pull up the math how to study guide that is in the shared Google Drive. Math, 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 math problems. Here you go. Math problems. And let me go to let me go to the whiteboard and pull up the proration. Prorations, prorations. There we go, prorations. Okay, so on the whiteboard here, here's a problem that you would get Here's a problem you would get on state exam. You guys see the whiteboard? Yes. Here's the problem. It says if the seller, hmm. what did it do? All right. It says if the if the taxes on the property are ninety five hundred dollars per year, and the seller paid the second quarter taxes, if the closing takes place on May seventeenth, who gets a credit and for how much? Well, here's a little chart that you guys have as a tool. Uh, let me give it to you on the math how to study guide. It's a little bit clearer. Okay, this is the math how to study guide that I prepared for you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows you th this chart right here is a tool that I'm teaching you right now. They're not giving you this on exam, this, but this is a useful chart for you guys on your scrap paper when you take your exam, your state exam. This is, you're not going to have a question about this on school exam right now, but state exam, you will get a question of proration of math uh, for taxes. And it's a real easy problem to figure out. If you got this tool, you could visualize it, which makes things so much easier. Because the question would be worded something like this, you know, well, this, it's a, this is the same problem. I think, the, I think the numbers are a little bit different. Let me just check. Yeah, they're a little bit different. Okay, uh, so yeah, let's just look at the problem that's here in the proration uh, math study guide, okay? If the, if the taxes are $8,500 and the seller pays the second quarter taxes, closing takes place on May 17th, who gets a credit and how much? Well, this is easy to evaluate. Let's see, the seller paid the second quarter. So if we make a box for each month, we just put the initial for each month, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. And then there are three months in each quarter. So we're gonna start with a long line and then we're gonna separate 
the next three, and then we make the long line on the next one. One, two, long line. One, two, long line. One, two, long line. And now you have a little chart here where you could visualize when this, when the beginning and the end of each quarter is when the taxes are due. Mm -hmm. So if the seller paid the quarter and the second, uh, the second quarter taxes, well, here, boom, they paid right up to here. Mm -hmm. Easy to visualize, right? Mm -hmm. And if the closing is taking place on May 17th, January, February, March, April, May, mm -hmm. okay, so that's a little bit past the halfway point, right? So we could visually see there's one full month and a couple days in here, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Well, we got to do a little math. Um, instead of going with this 8,500, we're going to go with the, uh, the whiteboard here on the 9,500, okay? Uh, so if the taxes are $9,500 a year, you're going to do this. Ninety five hundred divided by twelve months. That's seven hundred ninety one dollars and sixty six cents for each month. And we know that there is one full month in here, so I'm just going to write seven ninety one sixty six right here. Mm -hmm. And generally, who has to pay the taxes on the day of closing? Who owns the property on the closing date? Buyer. The buyer, it's, it's generally accepted that the buyer owns the property on the day of closing, and therefore they're responsible for that day's closing expenses. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it could be charged to either party, or it could be split amongst them, okay? It depends whatever the closing agents agree upon, okay? Um, I, I've had people get into arguments over this crap, <laughs> but never underestimate the cheapness of people. Anyway, um, so if you want to find out how many days, okay, so if there's 30 days in each month, if we're basing it off of a 360-day calendar month, right, and the closing's on the 17th, we just do this. There's 30 days per month minus 17 days. That's 13 days. But once again, generally the buyer owns the property on the day of closing, so we're going to add that one day, the closing day. So there's 14 days left in the month. Right. And if we take the 9,500 divided by 360 days in a year, right, that's $26.38 per day. Times that by 14 days, and that's 369.32. So add the 369.42 for that remainder of 14 days in here in that month. And then the one full month of 791, we add them together and we have $1,160.98. And that goes to the seller. And it goes to who? Seller. The seller. Why does it go to the seller? Because he paid for the entire quarter. And But they're not gonna be living the entire quarter. So you could see how the, you got this little, this shows you the gap. They paid to here, but they're closing here. So there's this gap that they need to be refunded. Why? because they paid for it. Who gets a credit? Exactly. Whoever paid for it, right? Now I'm gonna show you how they make it hard. This chart made it very easy to visualize, didn't it? Yes. So this is a tool, Learn, see, see how I drew it here? This is a tool, I'm teaching you guys this tool. It's a great tool here. And um, even though this is not in the slideshow right now, it is in the math how to study guide, like I said, right here. And I explained this to you, Gen you know, generally the buyer owns the property on the day of closing. So you're gonna add that one closing day to that as well. Um, and Victor, it's, it's always 30 days, like even though May has- in, in, in real life, in real life, you count months uh, based on the 30 day calendar, uh, uh, 30 day month. But if you're gonna be going down to the day, you should use the actual number of days in the month. But for exam purposes, because that's a little bit difficult, is it a leap year? Is it, you know, uh, how many days in this month versus that month? They're trying to standardize it, make it a little bit easier. They'll base it off of a 360-day calendar year. Okay. And that's only for the exam purposes? That's only for the exam. Got it. Okay. okay. Thank you. But the question will tell you that, too. Okay. Okay. If they base it off of a 365-day calendar year, don't uh, just, just divide it evenly so every month has the same amount of days 
you don't have to remember which months have more, which months have less, okay? Just read it how they give it in the question though. Based on yours, you divided it by 360, right? Correct, I did it based uh -huh. off of 360 calendar day. Okay? So um, here's how they're gonna make it. See, we got the answer right here. And we know the seller gets the credit. And that's correct and correct. How are they gonna make it hard for you? Well, this tool, first of all, made it very easy for us to figure it out and visualize it. The way they make it hard on exam is how they write the answer. Read that, read that quickly and quietly in your heads as if you would when you're taking a test. Credit seller, debit buyer, 116098. Credit buyer, debit seller, 116098. It, it scrambles your mind, doesn't it? Credit seller. Credit seller, credit, buy, cre credit seller, debit buyer, credit buyer, debit seller. And they'll have two more options. It'll be four multiple choice, but you'll only have two with the right answer. Mm -hmm. We know that the seller gets the credit. So just calm down and take a breath and look for the one where the seller's getting the credit. Because a lot of times people read it quickly and they went through the math and they got the math right. And they know the seller gets the credit, but this scrambles their mind how they read it and they select the wrong answer. Take your time, guys. You got four hours to take these exams. All right. So don't rush it. It's an easy problem that you should not make this mistake. Okay. So I showed you the little, I, I showed you this tool here, which is, which makes it real easy to visualize, right? And the answer, take your time reading it. Okay. So let me close out of that. Let me close out of this. And let me uh, finish off by leaving you guys with a little bit of a smile. I'm going to read you some goofy real estate humor. And then we're done for the day. And you guys are done. Ready? Yeah. All right. So I sent this to you guys. And I'll put it up on screen for you so you could read it along uh, with me here. All right. It's probably fake, but who knows, you know? Um, now, th there is a little bit of a religious element to it. So, you know, uh, just, just go with it, okay? It's not meant to offend anybody or go with anything, okay? So it says, you gotta love this lawyer. Everyone who ever bought a house uh, will enjoy this. A New Orleans lawyer sought an FHA loan for a client who lost his house in Hurricane Katrina and he wanted to rebuild. He was told that the loan would be granted if he could prove satisfactory title to the parcel of the property being offered as collateral. The title to the property dated back to 1803, which took the lawyer three months to track down. After sending the information to the FHA, he received the following reply. Upon review of your letter joining your client's loan application, we noted that the request was supported by an abstract of title. We learned about what that means, right? It's a condensed history of all the documents in the public record. While we compliment the able manner in which you have prepared and presented your application, we must point out that you've only cleared title to the proposed collateral property back to 1803. So before the pro final approval can be accorded, it'll be necessary to clear title back to its origin. Annoyed, the lawyer responded as follows. Your letter regarding title case number or whatever, I note that you wish to have the title extended further than 194 years covered in the present application. I was unaware that any educated person in this country, particularly those working in the property area, would not know that the Louisiana was purchased by the US from France in 1803, the year of origin identified in our application. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha moment there, huh? So. For the edification of the uninformed FHA bureaucrat, title to the land prior to US ownership was obtained from France, which had acquired it by right of conquest from Spain. The land came into possession of Spain by the right of discovery made in the year 1492 by a sea captain named Christopher Columbus, who had been granted the privilege of seeking a new route to India by a Spanish monarch named Isabella. Now the good Queen Isabella being a pious woman, uh, that means very religious, and almost as careful about titles as the FHA, took the precaution of securing the blessing of the Pope before she sold her jewels to finance Columbus's expedition. 
Now, the Pope, as I'm sure you're aware, is the emissary of Jesus Christ. Christ is the Son of God, and God is commonly accepted to have created the world. Therefore, I believe it's safe to presume that God also made the part of the uh, world called Louisiana. God, therefore, would be the owner of origin, and his origin dates back before uh, the beginning of time, the world as we know it, and the FHA. I hope you find God's original claim to be satisfactory. Now, may we have our damn loan? <laughs> and it says he got the loan. <laughs> It's a little goofy, you know, I, I thought it was cute, you know, it's real estate humor, you know, what do you want? Yeah, um, it's a little, a little bit of a knee slapper. Anyway. <laughs> it was funny. I'm glad that you guys enjoyed and relaxed there a little bit. Hope you enjoyed the class as well. Um, these videos I do upload and I will be uploading this one from today as well. I'll be re-uploading it. Um, and uh, I put up the poll there for your class attendance. So you guys could just answer that. And um, I bid you adieu. Congratulations. You finished right. your hour. Thank you for uh, everything. You Thank you, Victor. You no, no, I really yeah. enjoyed your class. Oh, I'm glad. Very, I'm glad. Good, very good teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, we Thank pass you. the exam soon. Teacher. Thank you. <laughs> I do too. I do too. I wish you guys the best. Thank you. All right. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, one, Bye. Hey, one question. Sure, sure. I'm not going nowhere. I'll be here for uh, you. One question. Yes. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, can you give some certificate for, for attending the 74 of 